Hey VC, it's uh, Jonathan, your cheap and cheerful record collector. Hope everybody having a great summer. Um, hope your weather is as nice as it is here in Maine. Beautiful day today. I haven't done a video in a couple of days, a couple of weeks actually, because I've been so busy with the side project I've been doing, I haven't had time to think about anything else. But I've been thinking about making a video recently uh, showing the books that I've collected over the years, um, all about rock and roll and music, etc. Um, but then I said, you know, it's supposed to be about records, not supposed to be about books. So then I decided I would pair up each book with a record that sort of matches or goes with it. So um, let's see what we got here. First book I got, this is one I picked up at uh, Goodwill a little while ago for a buck. It's called For the Record. And it's basically about this man named Alex Steinweise, who is the man who invented the record cover jacket. Uh, before him, it was all 78s, and they were all done as used to call, they used to call them tombstone uh, covers. No artwork, nothing on the front. And uh, he went, he got hired by Columbia, and they gave him a chance to try something. And he Creek had the idea of putting uh, a colorful cover with a name on it. And uh, those are the kind of things he did. And I guess after the first six months, the first record he did just sold ridiculously. And then they decided to make it a thing and he became their in-house uh, record album drawer. And he was the first one to do it. He uh, said he went to a record store once, saw people flipping through the records and realized, oh, I gotta put the name at the top of the record because that's what people are looking for. And these are all different record covers that he created. And it's just a great, great small book, but it's just fantastic. The stuff he did on here. Midsummer Night Dream. Uh, Cole Porter. So he was the first one. He was like 22 years old when he went to work for Columbia and worked for them for many, many years. But he invented the record cover as we know it today. And actually, when they first had the first 33, they came to him and said, all right, we have this new album, new thing called the 33, not a 78. It's bigger. We got to find some way to market it. And he came up with the whole idea of the cover that we know today. So Alan, St Alex Steinwoss, great book, just a great little discovery for a buck. No record to go with that. Actually, all my records go with that. Next one I have is a book I just picked up recently on Bix Beidebeck. And it's called Finding Bix. And it happens to be an autographed copy. The guy who uh, wrote the book spoke here in Portland recently, gave a lecture. And um, I don't know if you know Big Spiderbeck, but he was a jazz coronetist and trumpet player from the 1920s. He was one of the first, after Louis Armstrong, to really have an impact on his trumpet playing. Um, he was a middle class, upper middle class white guy from the Midwest. And when his parents found out he was actually playing jazz, they disowned him and unfortunately ended up drinking, drinking himself to death by the time he was 33, I think it was. I haven't read the whole book yet. But a great, 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 great uh, coronetist and uh, trumpet player. And that goes with this record, the Big Spiderbeck story, uh, The Whiteman Days. He played in the band, Paul Whiteman's band. So this is a great record on Columbia. Big Spiderbeck. If you don't know Bix, check him out. Just masterful. Next book I got is a book I got a little while ago, which I just love. It's a, more a photography book than a rock book. It's called Who Shot Rock and Roll? And it's basically about all the different uh, photographers and all the pictures they shot of in different rock concerts. As you can see, the great Chuck Berry there, great photo. Um, the one I chose was the early Beatles photo with Stu Sutcliffe in the corner there and Pete Best, the uh, original band way back when. Uh, this is a great book, has many different photographers in it. Um, it's The Clash, is The Rolling Stones early on, is Eric Clapton, Patti Smith, 
cramps and CBGBs. So a great, great book. So since I picked the Beatles and it's early Beatles, I matched that up with the uh, first U.S. Columbia, I mean, Capitol recording of Meet the Beatles. There's a nice mono version I had a while, I got for a while now uh, on the Rainbow label. Oh, in the background is a record that I had and didn't realize what it was until Brian from Cam uh, Shamrock and Records was over and we were looking through some records and he pointed it out to me. And this is Blue Angel, which is actually this young lady right here is Cindy Lauper. And this is her first album before she went out on her own. I picked this up recently, really inexpensive. So as you can hear, this sounds like Cindy. It's, it's sort of fun. Uh, next book I got to show is this a great book of R. Crumb called The Complete uh, Record Cover Collection. Really nice, comes in an old slip cover like an old 78, slides right out and actually um, it's just a great book with all our crumb, all the records he ever did, all the covers he did for all sorts of records. Um, if you're into our crumb drawings, I would highly recommend this book. It has it just has everything in it. It's just fantastic. Rompin' Stompin' Ragtime, great drawing. Robert Johnson. Um, Roy Smeck plays Hawaiian guitar, banjo, ukulele, and guitar. So, another great book. R. Crumb, if you uh, are into that, R. Crumb at all, this is a must-have for your collection. And this, obviously, I matched up with the most famous R. Crumb album cover, Cheap Thrills, from Big Brother and the Holding Company. Next book is a book I picked up, at the, again, at the Goodwill. Cost me like two bucks or something. I still haven't gone through the whole thing, but it's sort of cool. It's called The Definitive Elvis. And the only reason why it's any way definitive is that it lists all, besides all his recordings, it lists all his recording sessions. The year, who was on, who played with him, where it was recorded, which is very cool. So, um, 1957... Uh, January 12th through 13th and 19th, I believe, January 12th, 1957, Radio Recorders Hollywood, and has uh, Scotty Moore on guitar, Elvis on guitar, Bill Black on bass, uh, drums DJ Fontana, piano Dudley Brooks, vocals the Jordan Ayers. So it really is very complete, shows all his recording uh, sessions, and then in the back has all his recordings, all his albums, all his singles. So it is pretty cool. The definitive Elvis. And that I hooked up with a Elvis album I picked up a while ago, which is sort of cool. It is a date with Elvis. And on the back is 1960 with the calendar. And it's a uh, really nice gatefold. Elvis just getting out of uh, the army. And I had read somewhere at one time that this was only for um, his fan club. I can't swear to that, but that's what I heard. So that's sort of a cool little find. Uh, next book is a book a friend of mine gave me when I was in New York visiting. <clears throat> we were discussing music, and he said, Oh, you know, if you want this, I really don't read it. I'm not that interested in it. Yeah, it's yours. So it's Pete Seeger, and it is How Can I Keep From Singing, The Ballad of Pete Seeger. And I don't know if people know Pete Seeger, but he was a part of the group called The Weavers. Before that, he sang with Woody Guthrie and traveled the country with him. Um, and this one, which is sort of cool, is signed by Pete. He always signed and put a banjo when he signed his books or signed anything, so that's sort of cool. Uh, Pete Seeger really started the folk revival of the 60s and I saw an accent up with the Pete Seeger record I have called Story Songs. Uh, Baker's Dozen of American Ballads, about three saints, four sinners, and six other people. So this is a uh, Columbia record um, 1961 I think it is, so that's a cool record, really great record. It's like you know, folk music, he's the real deal. Not pretentious, the real thing. Uh, another book I picked up, a friend of mine lent me this, told me to keep it or pass it on when I'm done. I haven't just started getting into it. Hank Williams, and this is Snapshots from the Lost Highway. And it's uh, 
basically talks about Hank Williams on the road. Great photo of him there at a concert. A lot of real stuff you don't usually see around. Letters from him. Copies of original uh, writings. And again, Hank Williams is one of those guys that died at 29 years old. Drugs and alcohol, always the way. So, Hank Williams, and I match that up with the album I have called Hank Williams, Lost Highway. This is a Polydor reissue, obviously. Uh, Lost Highway, December 48 to March 49. Nice gatefold. Two record set, really clean condition. That's great, great record. Next book I got is a book my wife got me for my birthday last year. She, we were at a, a local museum and I couldn't stop talking about it and uh, she went over there and picked it up for me. So I'm very I was excited about that. It's called American Cool. And you see it's autographed, copy by the uh, photog photographer. And it basically has photos of everybody they think is cool in America. So I was the first one I just happened to go up to is Hank Williams, William S. Burroughs. Yeah, obviously there's Jimmy on the cover. Um, Frank Sinatra, Jack Kerouac, a great photo book. And there's the cover picture again, Jimmy. So another great book. I would definitely recommend picking this up if you're into photography at all. It's just wonderful. Uh, I love the front one, Billy Holiday. So I hooked that up with the Jimi Hendrix album I have, and this is one I picked up, um, I think I got this when I was down in Florida, I can't remember. But this one is, uh, again, one you don't see around a lot, but I was happy to pick up because um, I've never seen it before. Jimi Hendrix and Lonnie Youngblood, together again for the first time. Two great experiences together. Not a great record, but it's sort of fun to have. It's a unique record. You don't see it around a lot. Jimi Hendrix and Yanni, uh, Lonnie Youngblood. This be way before the experience. Next book I got is a book, um, which I love this one. This is called Live at the Fillmore East. And besides just a history of the Fillmore East in New York, there's the great Fillmore East. There's Bill Graham, who started it all. Forward by Mickey Hart, as you saw there. And besides all the great photographs and stories about the Fillmore East, whoops, sorry about that. That's Van Morrison and Eric Clapton, the young Eric Clapton, the young Van Morrison. Besides all that in the book, it also lists every concert at the Fillmore East, starting from the first day, which was uh, March 8th, 1968, with Big Brother and the Holding Company with Tim Buckley and Albert King, and to the very last show, which was 1971, I think. Yeah, um, June 71 was the Allman Brothers, Jay Giles Band, and Albert King. That was the last show. Another great book, if you like those, uh, rock and roll. I matched this up with a album, which has a couple of special meaning for me. This is the Mother's Live at the Fillmore East, June 1971, and the reason this has a special meaning for me is I was at this show. This is the show that uh, John and Yoko sat in for the late show. Unfortunately, I happened to go, I went to the early show because I had to work the next day, and I found out later that they came and sat in for the late show. So I miss seeing John and Yoko just by going to the wrong show, but I was at this concert, 71, the mothers, this is when they had... Um, uh, Flo and Eddie was sang with them back then, the two singers from the Turtles. Also, on the uh, this is Ainsley Dunbar, uh, Don Preston, Mark Volman, Ian Underwood. So it was a great, great, great album. So there it is, The Mothers, Live at the Fillmore, 1971. And then the last book, which is a book I think everybody who collects records should have. If they don't have, they should definitely pick this up, which is Dust and Green.